welcome. It's that time again. A massive hello from a very bright Macken, and it's got nothing to do with the recent forest fire. I'm delighted to say it's a lovely day, and I'm um, joined, of course, as ever, by the Bessie Car Massive, Mr. Gary Marshall of Martial Arts. And uh, I should ask before we go any further, where, where <laughs> what happened on the weekend with the uh, the mighty Bayer Leopard Cusin? Well, as as you know, as you know, uh, we went seven games unbeaten, but we've turned that round and we've lost three on the bounce. And I, I'm, I'm going to go out here on a limb and say this has never happened in football before. It will never, ever happen again, right? Our goalkeeper doesn't turn up. So we get a kid who's playing. He's on nights. He turns up and goes in nets. He's a centre-half. He turns up. He's on nights. Um, after 36 seconds, I look across. He's tying his shoelace. <laughs> kid lobs him. So we 1-0 down after 36 seconds, right? That's the first half. We're 3-0 down at half-time. Obviously, the talk at half time, keep it tight, we'll get back in this. These are shit, and they were, but we were 3-0 down at half time. So he's on the edge of his box as we start, as they kick off. He's now chatting to the centre half. Referee blows his wrist. Kid lobs him from kickoff, 4-0 <laughs> down, three seconds into the second half. So this is where, where I think this will never ever be beaten. He's kept a clean sheet in both halves for a combined total of 39 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Never be beaten. Uh, it's four two, by the way. There's definitely a trend developing to your, your little roundups. Every, every time we come on here, there's always seems to be some kind of goalkeeper gate where things have gone wrong in nets. Billy Ball is called as well, this kid. Oh, Billy name Ball. him and shame him, why don't you? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Listen, name and shame him, Billy Ball. <laughs> is he short or does he just do a lot of bending down? Well, he's a centre-half. He's not that short. He's about 5'11", something like that. But, yeah. Oh, okay. He's a lot short when he's tying his shoelace, that's a certainty. I... <laughs> I'm wondering whether we could just throw it out there to our listener and see if he might want to have a game in there. <laughs> Take anyone. Anyone. <laughs> well, I'm excited about today, guys. Very excited. I know uh, our special guest is a big mate of yours. And I, I'm on paper, I mean, you talk about dinner guests and this guy would make the ultimate dinner guest. What a life he's led. Uh, he wrote the book Box to Box. He, he was a premiership footballer. He's been a football manager. And then, talk about a career tangent, he goes off and becomes a boxer. But not just a boxer. We are talking about the British welterweight champion or light welterweight champion. Unbelievable, man. What a record. 31 fights. I think 24 KOs, uh, 24 wins. He'll tell us. He'll enlighten us. He's here. It is the uh, Driftfield Destroyer himself. It's Curtis Woodhouse. Woo! Yes. Hello, guys. Thanks for having me. Much appreciated. Yeah, problem, it's great to see you. How many wins were there in there? There were a lot, weren't there? I don't know, but you said 24 knockouts. It was nowhere near that, but we'll go with it, Rob. Yeah, Who am I, I to like argue? It. I like it. I've had as many of that. They used to call me the Corona King because people had wait all day for the jab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I've, um, I don't, I don't, I've, I'm training a couple of lads at the minute from Driftfield, young amateurs, and they're, they're trying to take my name, the Driftfield Destroyer, so... Yeah, I've got a bit of competition on my hands these days. Wow. Yeah. And yeah, it was like welterweight championship, not welterweight. You put seven pounds on me there, mate. Yeah, well, it was just looking at you here after after lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I wish I'd only put seven pounds on since my boxing days. <laughs> <laughs> what have you been doing with the lockdown? You, you, you're obviously the, the type of guy who keeps himself busy. The, the first lockdown, the, I mean, it seems forever ago, doesn't it? But the first lockdown was amazing. You know, because I, I kind of felt like I needed a bit of a break. Anyway, I had a million things going on, so it, it came at quite a, t a, a good time and enjoyed it in my garden. We had a lovely few months, didn't we? The sun and everything, so absolutely fine. Second lockdown, I found tough, and the third one, honestly, it was just a nightmare of just being stuck in, really. So really difficult time for everybody, and, yeah, I'm just so glad that we're kind of creeping our, our way back out. And, you know, I've got three children. My eldest was 18 last week. My little girl's 14 and my youngest is um, nine years of age. And I'm more gutted for them for the amount that they've missed out of their lives. It's um, it's unbelievable, really, because we're all adults. We kind of have a coping mechanism a lot, a lot better than children have. So we can kind of get our heads around it a little bit, what's going on. But it's been so tough for them. Um, my youngest stuck stuck in on his computer literally 24-7. You, know, you know, you forget about things like that. So... It's been tough, but we're coming out the other way, mate, and that's uh, and that's all that counts. That's brilliant. I, um, I saw Kyle um, was eighteen, and he uh, he had a few drinks, 
um, on his 18th birthday and uh, didn't handle them very well, did he? Struggled big time. I told him I need I need a DNA test. If you can't drink, fight, and shag birds, you cannot be a wood elf. So I'm like, what is going on here, mate? That's a that's a three things we can do. <laughs> yeah, he had his he had his first booze up on on Saturday. I actually played football with him Saturday morning. Um, I played in his team and he scored actually, so he was on a high. Um, Dad was still best player on the park by a mile, to be fair, but he got himself a goal and then he got in the pub after and his, and his teammates um, started banging these shots down him and he was downing all sorts. So, yeah, he was floating on air and he hit a brick wall at about seven o'clock at night and he just spewing his ring up and he was ill for a couple of days. So, yeah. yeah. That's the one thing I always say to Gaz, you've got to pace yourself when you're drinking, haven't you, Gaz? Oh, well, yeah, yeah I, I do. I, I can do it well. I've got the body for a drinker, mate. I can I can do hours, hours on end. Unlike <laughs> unlike Rod, he starts too quick. <laughs> Start, he, oh, he, he thinks it's a sprint, mate. Honestly, 30, 30 minutes in his bollock. Honestly, waste the time. Well, we were chatting in the pre-show, and uh, Gaz was saying because I've never had the pleasure of, of crossing paths with you, but Gaz has worked with you a lot on the after dinner circuit, uh, where you've already got an incredible reputation. And um, he was telling me that you're the closest thing he's seen to Alan Ball uh, in terms of an after dinner. As, as, as in, as in the story that he's got. Yeah. Really, it's yeah. a brilliant story. Yeah. Well, that's that's praise indeed, because to my mind, he was he was one of the absolute greatest on the circuit, wasn't he? It's was just a sentimental oh, yeah. story, and. Uh, but just a likable guy. So, uh, yeah. That's yeah, it's high, high, high praise indeed. And yeah. Gazzy's definitely in the top 50, I'd say, that I've worked with as well. So that's... <laughs> high praise indeed, Curtis. <laughs> high praise indeed. <laughs> <laughs> but now I've missed the after dinners, you know. I, I've missed them. I miss I, What I've missed more than anything during all this is, that, is people. I didn't realise, you know, how much you actually miss people and the interaction, the laughs. Um, sometimes, you know, the, the after dinner, you think, God, I've got to travel four-hour journey there, four-hour back or whatever. But, yeah, you don't realise till they're taken away how much you actually miss the interaction and the laughs that you have on, on, on the night. So, can't wait to get back. Just excited to get a few bookings coming in now. So, really? I'll be looking I, forward. I, I think I work I think I think worked with you maybe the week before they did lockdown. We did um, one up in, I want to say, Chorley way on, if you remember. Right. The football yeah, you team. Forget where, you forget where you go. You're all over the place, don't you? Exactly, and there was it was the first time you had to. It was all the wash your hands and all that shit, mate. Yeah, yeah. You know, watching watching fellas having a piss and then having to wash their hands. Well, that was an eye opener for me. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey. Well, it's great that you're on here. I'm sure you know a little bit of the uh, the premise, but Gaz is just going to uh, whip through that. Yeah. So basically, I've, I've sent you the uh, the categories. One that you have to choose is dinner guests. Um, Everyone chooses dinner guests, basically. Five people, you'll have to sit around the corner. They can be dead or alive. Uh, the other four um, choices you made were books, sporting moments, films, and for the first time in the series, childhood heroes. So we're going to start off with your top five books, Curtis. I can't believe you, you, you've you gone for it straight away with the book. <laughs> oh, exactly. Don't <laughs> yeah. worry. I, well, when you actually sent these over to me, when you said for top five, I thought we were all kind of picking one. I didn't realise I had to go with the top <laughs> five. So I don't think I've read five books, but definitely number one would be Box to Box, an amazing autobiography by myself. Still available. At, well, you probably get it about £2.50 now. Um, but yeah, if you get it on Amazon, about 15 quid, I think. So that's brilliant. Also, that's the your book... No Sorry, that's your number one? That's by far. Was it? Yeah. Was, was that... Was that a difficult thing to do? I always wonder when you're writing a book about yourself, Curtis, and you sit down. I mean, does it just pour out of you, or do you have to really, you know, oh God, I don't think this was. was it, yeah. What's the process? Well, you know what? Up until recently, uh, well, say recently, I'd probably say the last six, seven, eight years, I've been a bit of a closed book regarding talking about my past and things like that. Um, some really, really difficult times that I went through as, as a kid, and I kind of closed off from all of that. So once I actually did the book. I found it really therapeutic to, to actually talk about what happened during my childhood. Um, so that was really, really tough, but definitely um, liberating for me. And since then, you know, I, I can talk openly and freely about it without worrying about how people think or how people judge. You know, it, it, it was my life. I, I lived it. I made loads of mistakes, but kind of getting it out there and getting it off my chest was a really, really good thing. So I'm really glad I did it. 
That's brilliant. Uh, I look forward to reading that myself. So that's going in as number one for sure. Oh, yeah. well, 12 quid number first. Two, now you've you given you another minute to think of the next one. So the, the, the one that jumped off straight straight to me when you when you mentioned the categories, I, I read a book. I was in prison, actually, when I read it, a book called The Big If. And it's the autobiography um, uh, from um, Gary Owen. Is it Gary Owen? I forgot his bloody name. The boxer, the Welsh boxer um, from Merthyr Tidfield. Oh, Johnny Owen. Johnny, Johnny Owen. Owen. Sorry, yeah, Johnny Owen. Um, um, Curtis, Curtis, I'll stop you there before we go any further. I said, we've got Curtis Waters out. There'll be nothing Welsh at all. <laughs> yes. You're the man, Curtis. And yet the second thing you name, Merthyr Bastard Tidville. Right. Unbelievable. Mate, this book, have you read it, Rod? Yeah, I have actually. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you for why after you finish. No, yeah. So so the book, can you hear my dog barking in the back? Oh, yeah, yeah. Can you? Hold that's on, an, give me one. That's the ambiance of the Woodhouse house. Can I go? Can I come back yeah. in a minute? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. Just gonna give it a kick up the ass. <laughs> hey, that was great, guys. We didn't have to wait long there, did we? Oh, two in. Hey, and that goes to show you know the Welsh are they're, they're more popular than you realise. <laughs> the Welsh boxer. Oh no. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Ah. So, yeah. yeah. So sorry. The 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 Johnny um, Owen story called the Big If. He's from Merthyr Tidfield, yes, isn't he? Is. Yeah, and we've got a statue there, and the the book absolutely blew my mind because um, I didn't know nothing about him, and I obviously knew he was a boxer, and I knew he died in Las Vegas um, during a fight, but I didn't know the book. Um, but how the book was written? It was written by his father. Is that correct? Yeah, Dick Owen. Yeah, yeah. yeah and did did his did his his father really really struggled with everything, didn't he? Of coming to he terms did. with letting him out for that last round, and yeah. and the heartache behind all of that. And honestly, I. I it's the best book I've ever read. It was amazing. I, I couldn't um, I couldn't put it down, which was lucky because I was in remand for about 48 hours. So it was a, it was good that it was a page turner. But absolutely love that book. And it blew and my was, mind reading it. And as you mentioned there, there's a statue up in Merthyr of Johnny Owen, the Matchstick Man. That was his, his That's nickname. Him. He yeah. was really thin, guys. If you've never seen him, he, he was literally skeletal. And he went over and he he, he fought this uh, a Mexican guy called Lupe Pinto. Yeah. And my father was uh, my my dad Curtis was a, a a boxing writer for the Western Mail, soccer and boxing. So he he went over to LA to cover the fight, and uh, of course this happened. So my dad was uh, alongside Johnny Owen every day in the hospital, you know, because he was in a coma doing the report back. It, it was one of the worst. Worst periods of dad's life, although it was a fantastic, uh, you know, fantastic story. And uh, yeah, so he, he he knew the Owen family very well. And sadly, he never did uh, recover Johnny Owen and he, and he passed away. But he... Was it, was, it, was it a mismatch then that you over there? Oh, or was total it just mismatch. Total mismatch. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, literally a David v. Goliath, wasn't it? And... Uh, yeah, he was just, he had such heart about him, such bravery, and he, he, he just never knew when he was beat, did he, Johnny Owen? And um, he's gone down in Welsh folklore now. Um, yeah, it's amazing, the book. And I think, um, I don't want to give the book away for no one that's, that's, that's read it, but I think his father passed away during the writing of the book, didn't he? So the book was actually completed by somebody else. And that absolutely blew my mind. It was obviously, he'd never really forgiven himself for letting him out for that last round. Listen, I, I read in between the lines, I think that um, if he was boxing now, he wouldn't have passed a medical to start off with. I think he had a, a, a really wafer-thin um, skull. Um, oh. And he had, yeah, so it, it was it was probably something that was going to happen. But obviously now, with technology how it is now, the brain tests that you have, he probably wouldn't have been given a medical in the first place. But was a great fighter and yeah to read the book it was so emotional reading it and it, it, yeah proper it's the best book i've ever read by a mile nothing i've ever read apart from box to box obviously comes uh comes close to that so yeah uh, we got whales in didn't we brilliant well done. unbelievable you, you, you've made the day for me now i can i can relax happy after this <laughs> well, well the number three on your list curtis struggling now guys i'll be honest um <laughs> Yeah, so I've, I've actually read, um, I, I think it's called Unforgivable Blackness, and that's a, that's a book by, I think it's Sonny Liston, um, which talks about him travelling around America as a, as a young fighter and, and, uh, and, and the um, 
basically the the champion at the time who was white was refusing to um, to fight him and he had to chase him all over the country. And just a story about his life, it, it's amazing. It, he's lived an unbelievable, um, unbelievable, unbelievable life. Um, sorry, it's not Sonny Liston. Uh, I've forgotten the name, but it's called Unforgivable Blackness. It's Jack Johnson, it. sorry. It's Jack it's Johnson. a Jack Johnson story. Jack Johnson. Yeah, obviously the first um, the first black heavyweight. So it's it's his story and... He was a bit of a boy as well, and um, used to enjoy sleeping with white women, which didn't um, didn't lend itself too kindly at the times. And yeah, as an amazing character and a hell of a fighter. So that was that was a great book that I read as well. You're going to press me for two and one, guys, and I'll be honest, I'm really really struggling at the minute. So any help you can you can give me will be will be much appreciated. No, oh, listen, um, I'm a lot hey, more right there. I reckon give me three is good enough. There, eh? they've been that good. Those three choices. I Cheers, think Rob. We- we can we can close the the book on that. Dictionary, one. the dictionary is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm more of an autobiography man. I do like reading autobiographies. I said I said you would be. I said you would uh, yeah. be. I mean, uh, Mike Tyson's book. Uh, I I read that. That's 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 very interesting, as you'd expect it to be. But uh, that's the best one I've read. Oh, there's. <laughs> Frank Skinner. Is a good book. Oh, it's a belter. Absolute yeah. belter. It really is funny. If. Uh, if you're looking for, for for a good laugh, that's that's probably the funniest book you can ever find, isn't it, guys? I don't think I'd read a Mike Tyson one because I've seen that much documentaries and films and da da da. I like reading stuff on people that that I don't really know too much about, but have also always intrigued me. Um, so yeah, the Mike Tyson one I don't think could quite appeal to me. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what we'll do as we move through these uh, these categories. If anybody jumps out at us who, who might have a book that might be worth you reading, we'll we'll chuck it your way and see what we'll you wang it in. Perfect. But yeah. well, what if I say no, I don't fancy that? Um, <laughs> then the whole <laughs> point in. It falls a bit flat then. <laughs> What's the next category, guys? It's sporting moments, your top five. At, and I'm sure you must have five sporting moments. Have they got to be mine? Uh, I personally won't be listening to the Gibby Five podcast because I haven't seen Gibby one, two, three, or four. <laughs> have they got to be mine? No. Oh, yeah. right. Well, well, man's number one anyway. Winning, winning the British light welterweight title live on Sky Sports. That's definitely um, something for me that will always stand out in, in my memory because of obviously the journey I went on to get there and where I started from. I'll never forget. I'm a big boxing news fan. I've been, I've got them in my garage going back to like 1930. <laughs> my dad, my dad used to um, collect them. So and when he when he passed away, I, I got him. So I've got him going right back to 1930. And the week before my debut fight, I was fighting a guy called Dean Mark Antonio, who was ranked 189th in Great Britain. And I was fighting him, and I was ranked 189th, and he was 188th. So it was literally <laughs> the donkey derby. I, I was I was the worst in the country, and I was there on merit. So when when <laughs> But the only thing that annoyed me more than anything is we, we boxed and I beat him. And then the week after the rankings came out and I'd not even gone up. They kept me where I was. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, uh, yeah, I was gutted about that. And then obviously it took me nine years and I ended up ranked number one. So, yeah, to, to get that crowning moment live on Sky Sports is definitely something that I'll uh, I'll never, ever forget. So that's number one for me, guys. Uh, Sorry. So when, when did you realise you could box? Was it... What, what, as a football, was it were you, before you you did your football? So I know you always like to scrap. I know that. Yeah. So I assumed if you can have a fight, you can box. So like um, like most young kids with big egos, I'd have loads of fights. Always done okay. At my first fifty, I probably lost, but then after that, started to get better. Um, and then when I actually started boxing, that's when I realised how bad I was. I just thought, like, you go in, you wing them in, you hit them on the chin, they fall over. All the girls show themselves like, yeah, you get paid a million quid and we all go home happy. It was like happy days. <laughs> and then when I hit, like, a boxer for the first time, he hit me back. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> What's all this about? <laughs> I didn't realise how much technique and there was to the actual game and footwork and the movement. It's, it's such a complex game that looks so easy. And I was definitely one of them that sat on the set with a couple of beers saying, I can do that. And then didn't realise how bloody hard it was. I always tell a story. I sparred a kid called Daniel Thorpe, who's a, who's a journeyman Thorpe. He is, and a bloody good one at that as well. 
and he had like 187 fights. He'd lost like 160 of them or something like that. And he was one of the first kids I ever sparred with. He was down at Dave Caldwell's gym. And we did four two-minute rounds. I couldn't even manage three-minute rounds at this point. So we did four two-minute rounds. And Thorpe was hitting me with combinations that you can't even throw on computer games. It was bonkers. I've never seen anything like it. And I got and I didn't know who Daniel Thorpe was at the time. It's that down at Dave Caldwell's gym. And I, I know he trained like a few champions and Kel Brook and Ryan Rhodes. And I assumed Thorpe, he had, a, he had his head guard on, so I couldn't tell who it was. I assume, oh yeah, that must be like Ryan Rhodes or Kel Brook that I've just sparred. <laughs> so I, I got out of the ring and I was sat on the side of the ring and I'll never forget. It was my first day down at Dave Caldwell's gym. And I said to Dave, I was like, bloody hell, Dave, he's good. Who's that? And he was like, oh, that's Daniel Thorpe. He said, we're having a few problems with Thorpe at the minute. The board are trying to take his license away. And I thought because he'd had an injury or whatever, I said, oh, why? What's up? He said, well, he's not won a fight in 18 months. So he <laughs> said, the, the board are trying to stop him boxing. And I'll, I'll never forget, I just sat at the side of the ring. Bearing in mind, a few months before, I just retired from football. I still had another 18 months left on my contract. I've got a wife and two children at the time. And I remember sat there thinking, what have I done? I've made the biggest mistake of my life. I'm getting absolutely caved in by someone who's not won a fight in 18 months. So it was real. Um, boxing can humble you really, really quickly. Yeah, that'll be yeah. right. <laughs> Number two on your list. What was the category? I forgot. Sporting moment. Ah, there we go. See, that's what boxing does to you as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, I should have said books. We might have got another one out of you. <laughs> yeah. So sporting moments, the, 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 the whole... Like, so I was born in 1980. So my one of my first ever football memories was when... Um, was uh, Italia 90. The whole Gaza thing. And, and, and that, that was a... Not just one game, but the whole thing, you know, it was amazing. England got to the semi-finals. I actually seen a team photo the other day of that team. And, you know, everyone talks about how football's progressed and this and that. You look at that team now, you look at the England team now against that team. I'm not sure too many of our boys that we've got now that get into that team in 1990. You look at some of the players we had, absolutely unbelievable and Everyone tries to brainwash you of how football's evolved and how the players are so much better than what they are now. And then you look at that 1990 team and you look at who we've got now, and this is probably our best chance of winning a tournament for years and years. And I look at that and I'm like, well, no one's going to get in that team. None of them. None of them will get a kick. <laughs> so it, it, it's amazing. But that whole Gaza Italia 90 for me was... Uh, was probably the first sporting moment that brought me to tears. That was that was really that really captivated me. That that did the whole thing amazing. It was an amazing World Cup, wasn't it? Because you know, totally left field. The Italians had this idea of mixing the opera, you know, with the three tenors, with the, with with the with the football, and suddenly you know, opera took off, and it became like football became like a big art form, didn't it? The whole world was watching it, and it was yeah. absolutely amazing. And you, Bobby Robson was under massive pressure as well, wasn't he, going into that? And you know, you know, you now. You now look at how the whole, you know, country loves him, but people got short memories, haven't they? They were, they were hammering him up and down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. People, it, it makes me laugh, doesn't it? You know, when people usualise over people of how great they were, and you're like, well, we should have told him when he was here. Yeah. You know what I mean? So they hammered him. And, uh, yeah, I was, I was happy for him. I remember that little jig he did. I think it was when Platt scored that goal. And he did that little jig, did he, Danny? <laughs> it was so good. I remember that. It was the best tournament ever. I remember it. Loved it. <laughs> <laughs> number three this is, this is sporting moments by the way Curtis number three what do you mean sporting moments <laughs> just to get you thought it was books again that's all oh so the last two that I've done are alright they're right they're brilliant yeah they're fine okay, yeah, cool. fine brilliant Guy's just throwing me a curveball in <laughs> so one that I remember again amazing I remember when Frank Bruno won the heavyweight championship of the world against Oliver McCall I remember it like it was yesterday again it was on ITV wasn't it yeah. You know, back in the day when the big fights were on ITV and you didn't have to pay 15 quid to watch Derek Chisora have his 15th attempt to getting into the world's top 10. Bonkers. <laughs> we actually used to get good fights for free back in the day. So <laughs> I remember watching Bruno against Oliver McCall. Um, sat there on the set, my mum and dad who weren't killing each other. So that was a bonus as well. And I remember the, the whole living room was going nuts, going, God, Bruno. It was like we were actually sat ringside. And, you know, everyone loves Frank, don't they? And to see oh, him crowned yeah. 
yeah, to see him crown the WBC heavyweight champion of the world was even now. So I remember the whole fight. I remember every round like it was yesterday. I must have watched that fight a um, hundred times. And yeah, that was uh, that was a moment where our whole family sat down and watched watched the big fight, and it was um, amazing. Big That's Frank, what, love Frank. What what about what do you, what do you make of the uh, Mayweather against Logan Paul? Is it that's pay per view all of a sudden? It's crazy, isn't it? Especially when they didn't pick Josh Taylor's fight up last week, which was to oh. unify all the belts and was a hell of a fight. But yeah, yes. we have to pay twenty quid for Mayweather Logan Paul. I think the whole pay per view thing, the whole Sky thing, the shambles. They need. I think, um, but you know what? If idiots keep paying for it, they'll keep putting it on, won't they? No, no one should pay to watch that, surely to God. Maybe with a loan ball. But they will, Gaz, won't they? Mm. They will, yes. though. Millions will all yes. over the world. So, you know what? Like I said, my, my youngest son now is nine and um, he knows everybody on YouTube. You know, yeah. and, and same as my eldest son, who's 18. It's all YouTube now. They couldn't name me one character in Coronation Street or Emmerdale. It's all YouTube. So that's a, it's a huge market that maybe we, as, as an older generation, don't really appreciate or don't really yes. understand. But it's massive. Um, yes. And they're the ones that will buy the Logan Paul Mayweather fight. There'll be loads of them. My sons want to watch it. And I'm like, you're not watching that crap. And they're like, oh, can we get it, Dad? And I'm like, well, yeah, if we want it. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll watch it myself and I'll pay for it. And I've got yes. no interest in the fight whatsoever. But well, What I'll do is I won't watch it, but I'll just... Uh... Watch your Twitter account while it's on. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But yeah, it, it, it's bonkers, isn't it? You know, but you know, boxing's the hardest game to make any money out of. It's the hardest game. And, you know, we toil around for years and years and years. So to see someone like Logan Paul come in, oh, who's, who's, who's playing at it, who's not really a boxer and to make loads of money out of it, leaves a bit of a bad taste in... in Fighters like myself, who's like said, I'm I, I'm not a good fighter whatsoever, but I'm, I was a solid domestic fighter. You know, we fight for peanuts, two and a half grand here and there, and you pay your manager, your trainer, you come out with maybe eight hundred quid for a twelve week camp. You know, so we toil and then we're hoping for that big shot on Sky TV, where then you might get a six grand purse. And then mm -hmm. if you get a title shot, you might get a ten grand purse. You know, so we toil away for years and years and years for absolute peanuts. And um, so, yeah, you know, good luck to them, but it, it definitely leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Yeah, yeah. Well, then, number four on your list? Number four, I would have to say, quite a recent one-ish, really, was Tim Henman when he first won Wimbledon. Tim uh, 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 Henman? Uh, good choice. Sorry. Um, Andy Murray. Andy oh, yeah. Murray. I'm not giving boxing a good advertisement here, am I? <laughs> <laughs> My brain scrambled. <laughs> could have been worse. Yeah. Could have been Bobby Robson winning it. <laughs> but yeah, and Andy Murray. Um, I'm not even that big a tennis fan. I play tennis. I what I only watch Wimbledon or, or the majors, but I, I proper got engrossed in that one and really, really wanted him to win. He's a big boxing fan as well, isn't he? Is Andy Murray? Was that against and, Djokovic? That was that. Uh, I think yeah. the first time was Djokovic, wasn't it? Yeah, Did he beat Djokovic, Djokovic in both finals? Ooh, that's a good question. Might have been actually. That's a I'll, I'll produce or find out. Ian, Ian that's the yeah. sort of thing he loves. You give him something to do there, Curtis. That's brilliant. Yeah, but the first one w w w was amazing. And, and again, I always remember the ones that you sat around with your family watching. And I remember we, we, we were all sat down watching that one, screaming, screaming him home, and delighted because I can't, you know, in my lifetime, a few years back, you'd never thought that you know a British player was going to win Wimbledon. We were just getting crushed and out in the first round all the time, and then. Tim Edmund came uh, along and had a little bit of a little bit of a go. Kept going out in the semis, didn't he? But yeah. to be fair, he did keep coming up against Sam Pras and you know players like that. So he never really thought we were ever going to see one in, in our lifetime. And then Wallop here comes Andy Murray and he and he wins it. So yeah, that was that was an amazing amazing one. I won't forget. Rawanich was the other one, right? Never heard of him. <laughs> I'd have probably beat him. <laughs> and Tim Edmund. Yeah, and I definitely beat your final, too. Your final sporting moment, Curtis. So my final sporting one is the miracle of um, Madonna, is it? Madonna, oh. So probably not for the reason you're thinking, guys. I'm not a big, big golfer. I've probably played three rounds of golf in my entire life. I'm normally one of them that says I'll, I'll meet you in the 19th after. But we're in the pub watching it. There's loads of us. Uh, and one of my really, really good mates, a guy called Eddie Walton. The world's worst gambler. 
Honestly, he, he can get anything beat, that lad. So, <laughs> uh, honestly, guys, you've never met anyone like him in your life. It, it's just so funny just being around him because I've never, he just, it's, it's, he's got the worst look ever. So we're in the boozer. Sunday afternoon, wasn't it? The miracle. Yeah. Yep. Sunday afternoon, we're all in the boozer. And uh, and what were, how many were we down? We were loads down, weren't we? It looked Ten like six down, I think we were. Ten yeah. six. So it looked yeah. like it was game over. And I'll never forget, Eddie Walton picked up the remote in the pub. It used to be the pub my man, my mum used to be landlady in called The Falcon. The greatest pub ever. It's actually just closed down, gutted. Um but he, he, he got the remote, he turned the volume down, and he said to the pub, I will give anybody in this pub 33 to 1 for Europe to come back. 33 to 1. So so everyone, was, everyone started having a quid and a fiver. Literally, he put the remote back behind the, um, back behind the bar sat down, watched it, and everything started going in. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. We like 60 foot putts were going in. He was sweating. It ended up costing him about 1,500 quid. <laughs> <laughs> I've never was, seen anything like it in my life. It was, was amazing. Was the, that was one of the greatest nights of my life. I was uh, I was over in Dubai, right. believe it or not, with uh, Sir Ian McGeekin. Uh, oh, I'll just pick that name up. Uh, yeah, uh, Sir Ian McGeekin, and uh, we were watching it in a... This is how good it was. I mean, D- Dubai, to have a beer in Dubai is ridiculous. We're at this bar, and they let every ev- every one of us have uh, half price drinks. The fellow that was with us bought us like a three, three or four-course meal, and we watched the Miracle of Medina as it was happening. And I'd also had a bet on, uh, on Europe after day one at five to two. So watching that come in... Yeah, that's It's amazing, wasn't it? It was, oh, it was brilliant. crazy because so many weird things happened for Europe yeah. to get back in it, didn't it? It was yeah. right. And what Tiger, it was like a snowball give, effect, wasn't it? Tiger to give Molinari the uh, three or four footer, the last as well, to make yeah. Europe win it as well. Yeah. yeah. Your mate was going, make the bastard put! Why, did, why didn't you make him take that put? Why, did, why didn't he? I don't get it. No but, idea. Because it was definitely slippery. Yeah. Maybe Tiger was maybe Tiger was on at thirty three to one. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, brilliant then. You got um, you winning the uh, the British title, Italia ninety, Bruno McCall, Andy Murray's first Wimbledon win, and the miracle of Medina. Brilliant. Your next uh, is films. Your top five films, Curtis. Don't really think these through, to be honest. <laughs> like I said, I thought I was just picking one, and then everyone was going to chip in and help. No, I'd have asked for more money if I knew it was just a Curtis Woodhouse show. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll just think I'll talk about it. I'll tell you a, a film that I love, which goes under the radar. A film called John Q with Denzel Washington in. Yep, right. Have you seen it? I've not I've seen, seen it. it. Yep. Amazing. It's basically, I've just explained to you, Rob, it's about this guy, just a normal bloke. He, he, he goes to watch his son play baseball one day. His son hits the ball, goes to run around the whatever it's called, and uh, falls down with heart failure. Now, over in America, if, if you've not got insurance, you haven't got enough money, you basically don't get treatment. That's just how it is. And obviously, he's from a poor um, background. So he took, took his son to hospital, thought he had insurance through his work, but his insurance didn't cover the operation that his son needed. Basically, a heart transplant didn't cover it. So Denzel Washington goes around all his friends, begs, steals and borrows, can't get the money together. It's a ridiculous amount. So his son's just sat in hospital and he's going to die unless he gets his heart transplant in X amount of days or whatever. So this is what I love about it because you can we can all picture ourselves doing something similar. He takes the hospital hostage and basically says to the doctor, operate on my son or I'm fucking going to kill you. <laughs> do you know what I mean? He, he's at his wit's end. He doesn't know what to do. And it's just an emotional roller coaster of, of, um, of basically a father's love for his son that'd be willing to do absolutely anything for him to survive and to get through it. So I love the film. I've watched it so many times, and every time I get a little lump in my throat when um, when I'm watching it because we if we could all imagine ourselves doing that, couldn't we? If you if you don't know what yeah, if you don't know what to do, it just shines a light on how shambolic. Um, yeah. America is and how lucky we are really to have the NHS, aren't we? Even oh, though uh, 
the Conservatives are trying their bollocks off to take it off us, but we're hanging on in there. I was trying to think of the Ducks with the Ducks as James Woods. I've just had a look. James right. Woods was the doctor. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Robert yeah. Duval was in it as well. Robert Duval. Well, well, what's going on with you boys all voting their conservatives these days? The Welsh, aren't they? What's happening? <laughs> it's just, we're all, we're pretty mixed up here, I think. It's fair yeah. to say. <laughs> Good Yorkshire boys, us. It's, I, it's, it's, Gaz it's has got loads of money now, Gaz. Yeah, Gaz I've, might I've, vote conservative now. He's got loads of money. You know, I'm not keen on Boris, I'll be honest with you, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Chucked a bit of politics in, haven't we? We're going for it today. <laughs> That's because you're struggling with your second film. Go on, what's your second film? It's got to be Rocky, hasn't it? Yes. <laughs> it's got to be Rocky, but Rocky Four for me, that's the best one when he fights a big wow. Russian. Oh, uh, Dolph Lundgren, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was Ivan Drago. That was a really good film, that. And I remember it was one of those films, Curtis, it was hyped, wasn't it, to high heaven? You yeah. Know, back in the day, you know, that became the, the, the focus of everything. And, uh, uh, and that was that shot of the two fists. The yeah, Russian that's it. Fist. And they both exploded. I thought, I've got to see this. And it was, it, you know, normally a film that's that well hyped, it's a letdown, isn't it? But that was superb. It's For me, it's the, it's, it's the best, it's the best boxing film. I know everyone talks about Raging Bull and all, all ones like that. But for me, Rocky IV had, had everything you want. You know, it's a little bit cheesy. It's a little bit emotional. You know, it's class. You know, Apollo died. It had yeah. everything. All the yeah. space went out <laughs> It came out to Living in America as well. James Brown was in it. What a film. Oh, God. Yeah, unbelievable. And it became the highest grossing film in the Rocky series, apparently, taking over uh, $300 million worldwide. Really? Wow. Mm. Amazing, isn't it? I actually watched the documentary about Sylvester Stallone and about the Rocky things. And when he, he actually wrote the first Rocky, but wasn't going to star in it, was he? That's they right. didn't. They didn't want him to star in it. They wanted kind of an actor. And he hung on tight and said, the film only gets made if I play the part. And it looked like he was going to lose the script or no one was going to take it. But he stuck to his guns and, and got what he wanted. And the rest is history, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, incredible. And Joyce, He's actually a better actor than, than people ever gave him credit for. I think he was nominated for an Oscar, wasn't he, for, for that one. And when you watch that first Rambo film, he was superb in that with Brian Dennehy, wasn't he, that uh, first one? Yeah. Yeah, great film, First Blood. He doesn't really say much in, in it, does he? But it, 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 <laughs> no, it, it, it's so good. It's <laughs> so, it, was, it was the Kurt, Colonel Troutman, isn't it? Oh, Colonel yeah. Trout, so yeah. good. What, what was his name? Oh, dear, dear. Uh, who was that actor? Richard Krenner. Richard Krenner, wasn't it? Krenner. Is that him? Yeah. Good block, that is. Yeah. Well, I'm number three on your list. Struggling again here, Gaz. Struggling again. Number three. Um... I reckon it's probably a sporting one, another sporting one. Because we were guessing before, and we were saying, what sort of things will he go for? Will he be sporting? Will he be, you know... Is this, uh, is this my top five, Rob, or yours? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to give you a bit of breathing time. <laughs> You've had your Welsh bit for the day. Calm yourself down, you. Don't put twin it's down on it. It's Wednesday, it's Wednesday. <laughs> I've got one. I'm a, big, I'm a big Denzel fan, so John Q. Seen oh. John Q? You've already picked that one? Yeah. No, I'm not John Q. What's the other one that he's in? Only Fools and Horses. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the other one he's in where the... Equalizer. Where the, yeah, that's good, but that's not in there. The other one that he's in where he kidnaps that, that girl from... Oh, him. Man on Fire. Man on Fire. What oh, a yeah. film. What a film. What a yeah. film. Creasy. Yeah. He plays Creasy in that, yeah. That's it, Creasy, yeah. Well done, Rob. Yeah, good oh, film. Who's the, um, who's the girl in it? It's brilliant, the young girl. The little the blonde girl. Dr. Fanning. Yeah. It's a good it's film. Dr. Fanning's outstanding in that film. The Denzel's... only thing I couldn't understand was when he tapes that guy's hands to the steering wheel and his hands are like that, his fingers are, and he starts cutting his fingers off. I couldn't understand why the bloke didn't just do that. <laughs> <laughs> he left his fingers up. <laughs> I look, it's, a, it's a great film, that, isn't it? really is. Again, oh, Den them. Denzel Washington doesn't really say too much. But that's, it's just, that's, that's my favourite Denzel film, that, definitely. And it's I, it's my favourite Denzel film. As well. I'll tell you my favourite one, uh, Training Day. Yeah, that's good. Love well, that's good, isn't he, for that? Yeah, love yeah, that. Yeah. He's a nasty man in that. He's not normally nasty, is he? Yeah. He plays mm -hmm. a good bad guy, doesn't he? He does. He does play a good bad guy, yeah. He's got to be the best. He's, he's got to be, for me, he's the best actor ever. He has, yeah. You look at, you look at his body of work. It's outrageous, isn't it? 
Yeah. And it's different as well. Yeah, he does he does everything, doesn't he? Not seen him in many comedies, but he, he he's um yeah. He made a horror film as well, didn't he? Where he was like this spirit of a of a bloke on death row was jumping from body to body and it wound up inside of him. And uh, he turned nasty for a bit. But anyway, oh, really? making things up now. Yeah. I think he is looking at it. Yeah. You're making things up now. This is just <laughs> I'm making it up. Yeah. Come on, then we'll give you enough time to think of another one. How many, how many have I done now? <clears throat> You've done three. No, time is it? <laughs> it's quarter to twelve. Looking at that clock behind you. All right, yeah. yeah. Um, is that, that or your twelve stone nine? Is, <laughs> is this worse than when you're sat in the corner and the bell rings and you've got to come back out again? Yeah, good hell. Sometimes you just think, no, I think I'll leave it. <laughs> um, I tell you what, oh. I like comedy. Will go for white men can't jump. Oh, good shout! Yes, yeah. Woody yeah. Harrelson. I watched Woody Harrelson and. Wesley Snipes. Wesley Snipes, that's it, yeah. Yeah. Great film that, isn't it? Yeah, it is. The opening, the opening little, the opening little 10 minutes to that, so good, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's a long time since I've seen it, but yeah, when it came out, brilliant. Yeah. I want to put I that on. I watched it the other day. It's class. I love all the is that is that 90s? It's not 80s, that is it? Early 90s. Early 90s, oh, that's it. Really? White Men Can't Jump. Yeah. Great era for film. Late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. So 90s. the video shop. Remember the video shop? Yeah. They were fantastic, weren't they? It was From really... when you used to have to go into, like, the, the, the first video shops before Blockbuster, and you used yeah. to, like, ask for your film, and they used to say, do you want it on VHS or Betamax? Remember yeah. that? <laughs> Mine was in a garage. Mine was in a, a, a garage I had to go in. <laughs> we used to have a little garage. Yeah, we used to have a little place in Driffield that used to go in and they used to say, do you want it on VHS or Betamax? Yeah. Kids don't know the bond, do they? No, they don't, actually. Unbelievable. It'd yeah. take you longer to choose a film than it took to watch a film, wouldn't it? Because you'd have to... <laughs> yeah. Every box. Yeah. And then, you know, each, like, every video shop had, like, different sections, comedy, thriller, yeah. and then there was, like, a little CD alcove with all the blue stuff in there, yeah. wasn't it? <laughs> But the guy in our local corner, because we had a corner shop, he decided that he, he did everything alphabetical one day. So you had like, uh, you know, um, Deep Throat and Debbie Does Dallas in there with Delta Force and Dead Poet Society. It was fantastic. <laughs> Brilliant. Right. Well, then number five. Have I not done five? You've done four. Yeah. You can't pick John Q again either. John Q2? John Q1. <laughs> Rocky one. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me have a thing. Have you seen Creed? That, that, yeah, you know, I'm not a fan. No. I love Tony Bellew as well, but I'm not, I'm not a fan. I think they, they pushed the Rocky boat a bit far, haven't they? Yeah, for me, Rocky stopped at Rocky Four. Yeah, they rocky yeah. the boat to get yeah. a world title after one fight. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, it's um, <laughs> it is though, isn't it? Stupid. Yeah, it is. It is mad. But there was was in fact was Rocky Four actually the first type of like Mayweather Logan Paul? Yeah, Maybe they were ahead of their cool. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. You see it on the film, and then you start thinking it can happen, and then next thing you know, it's happening, isn't it? Yeah, I've got a last one. Just thought of one. Get in. Comedy. Wedding Crashers. Oh, yes, the wedding. How good Wedding Crashers? That was good. That was Class. really funny, wasn't it? That was. Yeah. Love Who's it. Isn't that Wedding Crashers? Um, um, Owen Wilson in it, yeah, ah. and the um, other guy. They've done loads together, them too, haven't ben they? Ben Stiller, Ben Stiller, no, oh, the big ben one. Stiller. Who is it? When it was wedding crashes, uh, definitely. You'll get it, Parsons will get it. Don't worry about this. It's the big Vince guy, Vaughan. Isn't it? Vince Vaughan. Vince Vaughan. That's it. Yeah, 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 Vince Vaughan. Jennifer Aniston's in it as well, isn't she? Yeah, she's in it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's another one I haven't seen for ages. Is she in it? Is she in it? <laughs> she was in John Q, I think. She was in. <laughs> no, I don't think she is in it. Oh, no, 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 no. It's that woman who looks like her. She's in it. Yeah. Yeah. So there you but, go. Anyway, John you dug Q. it out of there, didn't you? you get fair play. That was a struggle, that was. Rocky <laughs> Four, Man on Fire, White Man Can't Jump, and The Wedding Crashes. Yeah. Two to go.
I tell you what I don't like about Give Me Five, and that's that it's discriminatory against all the other numbers. I mean, what about Give Me Four, or Give Me Three, Give Me Six, Give Me Two? <laughs> How come no one's ever asked me to give them one? Um, that's rhetorical, of course. Two to go. <laughs> Childhood <laughs> heroes. Say that again? Childhood heroes. Oh, number one, easy for me, there's John Barnes. John, John Barnes. Barnes. Yes. Yeah, he's a top uh, top bloke, isn't he? I've yeah. never met him. Would love to meet him. Oh. He was my hero. Born in, I was born in 1980, um, and I was like all young kids. You support whoever the best team is. So I supported Liverpool, and John Barnes mm. was just someone who captured my imagination. Really, with everything around him, everything that he was. <clears throat> He was the same colour as me. He was left-footed like me. So he was just someone who I just identified with. And, and you know, you know, he got a lot of racial abuse. And it, just the whole way he carried himself. Loved the guy and was a hell of a player. Imagine John yeah. Barnes around today. Oof. There's that iconic him. picture where someone's throwing a banana at him and he's just, like, flicking it up, isn't he? Yeah. Class, isn't it? Oh, amazing. I don't know what today. You, you... Yeah, yeah. I mean, if he's around I today, love that advert. Isn't... You're looking at 150 million to get him. Pete John Barnes. I looked at his stats not long ago because people were giving me some sticks saying Ryan Giggs is better than John Barnes. I'm like, no, not a cat in hell's chance. And when you get up like Ryan, um, Ryan Giggs's stats for goals and assists, and then you put them next to John Barnes's and you go peak for peak, you know, Barnes was getting like 20 goals from left wing in a 4-4-2. Imagine John Barnes playing in a front three now at one of them outside forwards. Oh, forget it. He's, he's putting together Messi numbers and Ronaldo numbers. The guy yeah. was a monster. Big, strong, quick, good in the air, great finisher. Just a, a monster of a player. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've, got, we've got Jan Mulby on next week, and I know he says that the best Liverpool player he played with by a distance was John Barnes. Oh, he, yeah. I don't think people understand how good he is. And you know what? I think sometimes when you play for a team like Liverpool... You either support Liverpool or you hate them. There's no in between, is there? Okay. So I don't think people like John Barnes get get the credit. For me, John Barnes was one of the best players England have ever had, but never gets a mention when you when you talk about the, you know the gases and that pop up. But for me, John, he never quite did it on the international level for whatever reason. Yeah, in fact, I was, I was in fact, on that wasn't it? Like you say, his club form was absolutely ridiculous, and. Yeah. Uh, Apart from when he started off and he does that the goal against Brazil and what have you, I think near the end of his international career, he wasn't the greatest. That's probably what people think, I'm, I'm guessing, yeah. or remember. I think as well, you know what, so this conversation came up on Twitter and I think it was Adrian Durham um, on Drive Talk, Talk Sport. Someone was saying, like trying to belittle John Barnes, saying, well, he never did it for England, so he wasn't that good. And Adrian Durham... Durham um, tweeted back saying uh, he never did it for England he spent an hour and a half getting racially abused by the fans so maybe why <laughs> do you know what I mean even yeah. when he's playing for Liverpool at least when he was getting abused by the fans he had a good section that were getting behind him as well whereas yeah. at England he went through a period in England where everything that went wrong was John Barnes's fault um, yeah. even when you watch that documentary with um, um, Graham Taylor have you seen that documentary yeah yeah. When John Barnes is getting stick and he's like, I'm not taking him off and letting letting the fans have to pound yes. the flesh while he's coming off. Um, you'd think that I was in the 60s, wasn't it? But we're not talking a long time ago, are we? No, we're talking... Yeah. 90s, are we? Mid-90s. Mid-90s, because he was after... 92, 93, I bet. Yeah. 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 Scary, yeah. isn't it? What a player, though. What a yeah, player. He gets, he gets in my England 11 of all time. Not a problem, John Barnes. Yeah. Easy. He's easy. He's the a, he's a best left-sided player we've ever had. Definitely. You know? and, and people can say whatever they want, but if you, like you said, guys, if you're putting your best England 11 together... He's in it, definitely. He's in it. Number 11, John Barnes. Bang. Get mm. out on that left, son. Get some chalk on your boots. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> Number two, Childhood Heroes. I'd probably say Mike Tyson. Again, just from the, the, the era that I was born, 1980, Tyson was kind of wrecking his way through the through the heavyweight division in, in the 80s um, and had a real aura about him, didn't he? Scary. Yeah, yeah. He was... 
I think because of it come after the lull in the heavyweight division, there was Ali and then you had Larry Holmes who never really... Larry Holmes was more of a boxer, wasn't he? A technician. Like... So never never really caught the imagination. And then yeah. you get I this... Like Larry little, Holmes. Yeah, you get this little tank from a rough part of America that comes through and is just knocking everybody's spark out. Yeah. Black boots, black shorts, nothing nothing spangly or anything. Nothing was just... Yeah. 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 It was so <laughs> good, wasn't it? It was... Like say when people are judging Mike Tyson, such a difficult one because his peak, he'll have, t- he'll have given anybody in the world a fight. But because of his longevity and if you look at his actual his best wins on record, he hasn't really got that many great wins. His best win is probably Leon Spinks, who was a light heavyweight. Really? Um, so his best weight, his best wins are not don't for me don't put him in that top ten heavyweights or, or whatever, but. When you're talking about iconic fighters, there's a difference between being the best and being iconic. Yeah. And he was iconic. For me, he was up there with anybody. Obviously, you've got Muhammad Ali, who's a, who's, a, who's a set apart from everyone because of the time he was brought up in, the politics and everything. But after Muhammad Ali, if you think about iconic fighters, yeah. for me, Mike Tyson's right there. Yeah. yeah. Number three on your list, childhood heroes. Childhood heroes. I would have to say... Frank Bruno. Yeah, Frank Bruno. Like I said, that, that was my era. Um, when are, we you going watch alphabet- are we going in order? Five, four, three, two, one? Or no, anyway. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Whatever right, you- okay. it doesn't matter. How did you feel watching that uh, Tyson Bruno fight? I mean, were you concerned for Frank knowing that he was a hero of yours or did you think he had a chance? I mean, um, yeah, I thought he had a chance at the time. Looking back now, you kind of realise that he, he didn't really have much of a chance. But at the time, obviously, he had the hype. He'd just beaten McCall. This is Frank, you know, he's back to, he's at his best. Da, 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 da. He's going to keep Tyson long with that jab. And yeah. he hurt him in the first fight. Remember when he wobbled Tyson in the first yeah. fight? And yeah. Frank's a better fighter now, so he's going to do it this time. Da, da, da. So you kind of get caught up as a young kid with all the, all the hoopla that goes with it. But I think... Um, I think that Oliver McCall fight was kind of Frank's last stand, really, and he's probably already past his best, I suppose. Um, and yeah, even though Tyson at the time, you look at both, was, was way past his best as well. But I was oh, just, yeah. no one really remembers Frank. People remember Frank Bruno as um, the heavyweight champion of the world, don't they? And that's, yeah, you know, rightly so. Yeah, yeah. E- exactly. But the, the oh. second Tyson fight was, yeah, it was a tough one to watch. He never really got going, did he? Tyson jumped on him and, yeah, and got it, got him out of there. But yeah. the, the thing that the, the scary Tyson, the black boots, the black the black shorts. Frank had got like a crushed crushed velvet maroon shorts, which never for me seemed as scary as uh, yeah. black shorts. To be honest with you, I, I started I started getting worried the fifty fifth time that he crossed. He blessed himself on the way to the ring. That's when <laughs> I, I started to smell. I started to smell a rat. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I've worked, I've worked with him many times. He's, he's an absolute gent. Love Bruno. Like I said, he's another one. Like he's, um, I remember the, I remember the things you look back at. And you remember the normally the times that you spent doing something with your family. Whenever Bruno fought, it was kind of always a family affair in our house. We all yeah. watched it. So yeah, massive, massive. I've never met Frank, but would would absolutely um, would love to be in his company one night. Number four on your list. Number four again. We're going from that that same era. Um, so I would have to say Nigel Ben. All right. Love Nigel Ben. Again, from that era and, and the same mould as a Mike Tyson, really, where it was just an absolute wrecking machine. Yeah. And he was he was box office before there was such a thing called box office. Imagine him around now, pay-per-view. Oh Christ. You know, we're, we're getting we're getting Chisora chucked at us for 20 quid. Imagine imagine what would pay for Nigel Ben Chris Eubank era. Nice. Wow. Yeah. Ben wow. was a real Ben was a real menace, wasn't he? He was, oh, he, he was nasty. He just liked knocking people out. Class. Yes. Horrible, wasn't he? Horrible. Horrible. I used to come out to his song that he used to come out to, that Dangerous by um, Conroy Smith. Dangerous. Oh. I am dangerous. I remember <laughs> I was heartbroken when Watson beat him, like proper, proper heartbroken. Um, yeah. But yeah. Nigel Ben, I nearly actually fought his son um, a few years what back. Did- when. Yeah, Come nearly. I, yeah, I nearly fight. I nearly fought um, his son. So when I, I obviously retired after I won the British title. And I had a couple of years out. Went up to seventeen stone, 
and then took all the weight off. And my aim was, I needed something to aim at. So I thought, right, I'm going to get the weight off. I'm going to, I'm going to have a couple more fights. So I, um, I had two comeback fights and, and won them both. And then I, I, I was meant to fight um, an eliminator for the Commonwealth title against John Wayne Hibbert. And we were top of the bill, so our fight was on last. And um, the fight before us, Scott Westgarth um, lost his life in the fight. So our fight got cancelled and the show got cancelled. that Doncaster? Yeah, it was Donny Dome, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So I was sat in the dressing room, warming up, waiting to go on. And the the um, paramedics came in and said, um, Scott's collapsed in his dressing room, but it's just from heat exhaustion. Um, we're just going to have a 15-minute delay. Um, so kind of steady, steady up, we warm, warm up, and we'll give you a shout when to get warm back up again. So at this point, we're not kind of thinking anything's wrong. And that 15 minutes came half an hour, so we all know that horrible feeling as, a, as fighters that something's not right here. And then somebody came in and said he's been rushed to hospital. It, it doesn't look good. And then I think... He, he was, I think he was announced dead on arrival. Oh, um, yes. and he did, it, yeah, it was unbelievable. So I was actually speaking to him the day before at the weigh-in, just chatting and da, 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 And then literally 24 hours later, um, he's lost his life. And that was a real thing for me to be like, what am I doing here? You know what I mean? I pushed the envelope a little bit too far. Here. It's time to go. But at that point, I was in talks to, um, to fight uh, Conor Ben. Which um, at that time I think I'd have beaten him. I, th I thought I had a bit too much for him at that point, maybe a bit too much experience. And they came back saying it was actually Steffi Bull rang up to get that fight, and they said, "Oh yeah, we're up for it. We'll get back to you in the week." And they got back to. I thought they were going to discuss terms, but they said he's not. It was going to be over ten rounds, and they, they didn't think he was quite ready to step up to the ten round mark. Um, so they swerved it. And then I watched him last week and thought, "Whoa, thank fuck for that." <laughs> 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 he's another scary boxer, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Yeah, he's just got that attitude, hasn't he? Yeah. He's, he's young and spunky and ballsy. I, I, I like him, yeah. But he's got it, hasn't he? I like him. He, he, yeah. he, it's like, yeah, it's good. You look at him and think, yeah, I can get behind you. <laughs> Do you take the microphone off him after a, Let him have his two minutes on the mic and then take it off him. Because he he he, he, I, he always pushed it a little bit. I'm like, all right, Connor, we get it. You're hard. And I'll get the mic back. But... <laughs> He's young, isn't he? He's young and he's yeah. spunky. And I, I love seeing that in people. Yeah. Your final childhood hero? My final childhood hero would have to be Paul Gascoigne. Oh, brilliant. Paul Gascoigne. Yeah, like I said, I was born 1980. 1990, um, World Cup. Everything around that. He's just a legend, isn't he? Yeah. He's just an absolute proper legend. I remember he came to Sheffield United... Um, when he was playing for Middlesbrough and at the time we had like an average attendance of about 18, 19,000. We played Middlesbrough on a Tuesday night. There was 30,000 people there and they're all there to see Gaza. And he came off injured after about 15 minutes. <laughs> Fucking no one left in Bramall Lane. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone had gone. Um, I was an apprentice at the time. They were so good with all the apprentices. As soon as he walked in the tunnel, literally, all of us, because we're all the same age. We're all brought up around Gaza Mania around about the 90s. And he had a minute for absolutely all of us. Just a, yeah. just a great bloke and laughing and joking with us. And, Was he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. just a great bloke. And, you know, uh, it, it's it's sad to see how he's, how he's had his struggles with alcohol and things like that. But for me, I, 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 when I think of Gaza, I think of Italia 90. I don't like to get distracted with all the other crap. Uh, yeah. because we've all had our problems, haven't we? And, you know, hopefully he's in a good place. But when I think of Italian 90, I think of him, for me, the best player in the world. I, who was the last English player that you could say, best player in the world? Yeah, you're right. You're right. It was, it was Gaza, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And bef before him, who are you saying? I, I, I don't... Have we ever had someone who's the best in the world? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a very valid point, that. Yeah. He, he did embody that Italy 90 thing, didn't he? And... Uh, you know, on a, in another universe, they could have actually, they could have won it and nobody would have raised an eyebrow. It would have been the most normal thing in the world, wouldn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think as well, what, what made Gaza so great is his, is his naivety to the world. That's what made him so endearing to everybody, wasn't it? He, he wasn't media trained. He wasn't, he was just a, a lad yeah. from Newcastle. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was just a lad from Newcastle that all of a sudden had been sprung on to the world scene and, he, you know, he, he struggled with that, but what a player. 
Oh, I love a play. Yeah. Oh. So your fa- the final round is the dinner guests. They could, they can be dead. They can be alive. You could have you could have mentioned them before. These are your top five dinner guests. I'd have to go Muhammad Ali. Yeah. Imagine picking his brains for an hour. Just talk about his life with him for an hour. He's just amazing. And I, I, I'm i going to stick my neck out, Gaz, and say maybe... He is now the number one dinner guest choice. Really? Give me five guests. He's gone he's, he's, yeah, he's gone to number one in the list. Yeah. yeah. Just amazing. Yeah, I mean, amazing. where would you start? Where would you start with Muhammad Ali? There's so, there's so much, isn't there? Yeah. Um, just kind of what, what he stood for. How he fought as well, you know, Muhammad Ali, fast hands, amazing feet. What a great fighter! But what you found out in his later career is how fucking tough he was as well. Yeah. You know, behind all that bravado, when he had to stand there and take his punishment, he could take it as well. I remember the uh, the third fight he had with Joe Fraser, who bounced some unbelievable left hooks. I watched that fight not long ago. It's an it's an unbelievable fight. It's one of the most brutal fights you'll ever see in your life. And Joe Frazier could knock down walls with his left hook. And he hit Muhammad Ali with so many of them, head and body, um, just bounced off him. Even when he put him down in the first fight, the, the probably the biggest fight of all time, Ali Frazier won when they were both unbeaten. And Muhammad Ali had been in a three-year exile, came back. I think he fought um, Bonavito, who was tough anyway, hard man. And then he, I think he went straight into the Frazier fight. Or he might, have had, he might have had two fights and went straight into the Frazier fight. Wasn't really ready for that. And um, Fraser hit him with that monster left hook, put him down. I think he's down for like two seconds. Basically, his, his ass hit the canvas and he's straight back up. Um, so, yeah, be- behind all the bravado of I am the greatest and all the political stuff, mm. he was a tough, tough, hard man and a nasty man as well. You know, some of the things he did was was bad, you know, shocking. The way he spoke to his opponents, you know, the way he treated Joe Fraser was was pretty poor, calling him an Uncle Tom. You know, probably the worst thing you can say to a black man, really, especially in them times, an Uncle Tom, and really ridiculed him. And I know Fraser never, never forgave him that um, till the day he died. So he had a real nasty streak in him as well, Muhammad Ali. But a great human being, um, and like everyone, he had his faults. But I'd love to sit around at a dinner table and just have an hour chat with him just about everything. It'd be amazing, wouldn't it? What a guy. Yeah, yeah. Number yeah. two on your list? Number two on my list, I'd probably have to go Nelson Mandela. Yeah, yeah. Not for the first time he's been on the list, this. The first time? No, not the first time. Oh, right. I'm going to say, he must have had loads of fucking Klu Klux Klan on here for his first time. <laughs> 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 but again, what a remarkable man. It, 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 when, you, when you told his story, the outline of it, you're like, what? Yeah. It's unbelievable, really. And the, probably the most, for me, the most unbelievable thing is when, obviously, he'd come out of prison, he'd been in for that long. It'd have been so easy to kind of hate the people that had put him there. But he brought the whole country back together through love, yeah. you know, which is amazing. You know, you can't, you can't shine um, darkness on darkness and expect light to come, can you? And he oh. just basically embraced the whole country and brought them back together. I think the whole when South Africa won the World Cup and just an amazing period for that country, wasn't it? That had been through so much yeah. with apartheid and everything. And without him, I don't think that would have happened. Just an amazing man. Um, so yeah, I'd love to kind of sit down with him. He's just he's just got wisdom, hasn't he? People who can really enrich your life, he'd definitely be one of them. Yeah. Two two massive auras there in the room for that dinner party, I reckon. Oh, Christ. I can't wait for the next one. Two big egos as well. <laughs> Three, because uh, you're there as well, Curtis. Well, I've got bigger ego than both of them. <laughs> They've not won the British title, have they? Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> what was number three on your list? Number three. Okay, so number three, <clears throat> I'd have to go Mike Tyson as well. Yeah. I'd have to go him. Um, really, a really intriguing character, isn't he? And what a life he's had, you know, being in jail for for rape and all things like that. He's, he's had a really, um, an unbelievable story, really, isn't it? Yeah. And and as well, it's great to see him come through the other, other side and seems to be in, in a good place at the moment. Um, but yeah, and I'd, I'd love to sit down and just chat with him because when you, when you actually hear Mike talk, 
he's very, very engaging, isn't he? He is. I was just going to say, it's almost like he's mellowed, Curtis, isn't it? Now, uh, yeah. he seems so comfortable in his own skin now. Uh, whereas, you know, when he was a youngster, he just, you had the vibe that he was ready to kill anyone, didn't you? Yeah, I, th I think he, he, he's, he's been abused a lot, hasn't he, in his life? You know, financially, emotionally, everything's been taken away from him. People have took the piss. He, he, you know, he's from the Bronx in New yeah. York. He's got no education. He'll have people stealing off him left, right and centre. I can understand why he was angry. But yeah, he seems to have mellowed and, and, and found a place where he feels happy. But yeah, when, when he talks, I really enjoy listening to him. He seems a very, very knowledgeable person about life. Because um, he's probably experienced hell of a lot that none of us will ever, ever go through. So, yeah, I'd love to um, share a beer with him. He's into all them hallucination stuff as well, isn't he? Have you seen, have you seen that? He takes them magic mushrooms and all stuff like that. Does he? Have you not seen that? No, I've not seen it. Oh, if you, if you go on the, um, I think it's, um, I can't remember what podcast, Joe, Joe, um, he's the MMA oh, guy. Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan podcast, yeah. He's talking about taking magic mushrooms on there and how it kind of was an out-of-body experience for him. And he, he does it quite regularly. So, well, so well, yeah, he could maybe bring a couple of mushrooms with him as well. Make, make the night, <laughs> wouldn't it? Make the night. You can see Nelson on them. Oh, Nelson, <laughs> love that, wouldn't he? <laughs> I, I, I think he takes my list just for that scene in The Hangover with a Phil Collins singer. So yeah. Incredible, isn't it, that? Amazing. <laughs> so we've got two to go on your dinner, on your dinner list. So who, who have we got? Nelson, Mike, Muhammad Ali, Mike Tyson, Mam Dali, um, Michael Jordan. Oh wow! Yeah, that's always, it. always obviously been a fan of his because he's so big. But once I watched that documentary on Netflix, oh. I was like, "Oh, this guy's like elite." He just Absolutely. elite. I, mean, I was. I've never been massive into basketball, but after watching that, Jeez. I'm ashamed to say I haven't seen it yet. Oh. Uh, God, it's outstanding. It is. I'm the same as you, Gav. I'm the same as you. have never been massively into basketball. I could probably name five basketball players. But once I watched that documentary, I was like, wow, this guy. Like, yeah. just his, everything about him, just that elite mentality, aren't he? And that, that, that will to win and everything. I, I, I couldn't believe, after watching that, that they got beat with him in the team. Yeah. <laughs> that good. How have they got beat with him in the team? Yeah. So good. Yeah, but I'd love to. Um, he should be involved in in something, shouldn't he? Sport wise, he, he he seems like he's got so much to give back yeah. on a mentorship or something, even if it's not sport. To young kids, you know, he's such a he's such an infectious person when you listen to him talk, and you know the way he is probably isn't for everyone either because he sounds like he's really tough on people, but he fucking makes sure that you deliver, you get yeah. the best out of yourself, um, and I yeah. loved watching it. Absolutely loved it. I'm all about tough love as well. Sometimes yeah. it drives me mad this world we live in at the minute, but I'm all about kind of what he seems to be promoting, which was, listen, we're fucking getting the job done by hook or by crook. Um, you've, got you've got to watch it. It is brilliant. Was it The Last Dance, isn't it? The Last yeah. Dance, yeah. The I last think it's dance. Five, five series, maybe even more. That's a bit uh, more. Nine, nine episodes, is it? Like nine, that? yeah. Brilliant. Well, okay. Brilliant. Top, so, top class. This, this looks a great dinner party, by the way. And your final one. Yeah, final one. Final one. Let's go with. So we got, we got, we got a couple. We got three from sport. Yeah. What would you say now, Nelson Mandela is politics? Politics. Yeah. Yeah. We got the Let's... music there. What, um, what about Denzel? Oh, no, Denzel don't make it. I've seen all his films. Um, <laughs> I want to. Uh, I want to say Bob Marley. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I want to say Bob Marley. He'd be um, into them mushrooms, I'm sure. Yeah, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to say him. I'm, I'm going right. to say, I'm going to say. A bit of eye candy. Pardon? A bit of eye candy. I'm not sure I get lucky with the other four there, to be honest. <laughs> I'm not sure my story about Dean Mark Antonio goes down quite as well. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you who we're going to go for. I'm going to go for... Who's he? I don't know his name. I should do. I watched a documentary on him the other day and it blew my mind. Um, the, the lead singer for Queen. Freddie, Freddie Mercury. Freddie Mercury. Yeah. yeah. Let's get Freddie in. 
Bit really? of eye candy for him, not. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right, but this is probably the, the most A-list dinner party we've we've had so so far. Definitely, this it's a cracker. It is a cracker there. Yeah. Freddie Mercury's some boy, isn't he? Oh, he is. Yeah, yeah. He'd be well into the mushrooms. Yeah. When I when I watched that documentary out on him, I went on YouTube and and, and watched him performing. And he's, do you know, like you you look at programs like The X Factor, and they're all looking for the X. Well, he's got it, hasn't he? Yeah. He right. uses it. When he walks yeah. out, like I say, music's like, it's not my genre of music that I'd listen to, but I could just watch him on YouTube and turn the volume down and be entertained. Because yeah. he just he just had it, didn't he? He had that whoa, personality, just brilliant. Yeah. I'd love to know more about him. Um, a lot of my education has come through watching stuff and then reading up about that person. I didn't learn anything in school, really, but he's definitely something I'd like to learn more about. Um, his lifestyle as well, you know. Uh, getting AIDS and all things like that. He, he's got a fascinating story, real fascinating story, and I'd love to kind of know how he how he dealt with that emotionally. You know, a lot of people talk about mental health issues and stuff like that. He must have been going through hell at the time, trying to keep it all um, inside that he was even gay. Yeah, you know, that, I think be... that, that was a, that was a massive thing, wasn't it? Really, I mean, because yeah, he'd been out as gay even in the seventies, eighties, wasn't? Yeah, that not. Of... Yeah, not even being able to feel like he can come out and, and tell people who he is. And then on top of that, um, getting AIDS. And on top of that, having to be on, on, on a tour worldwide. Oh, imagine the stresses and pressures that, that he's under. Um, so, yeah, remarkable man. And someone I'm definitely going to be doing a little bit more um, research on. But, yeah, I'd definitely like to share a couple of beers with Freddie and... Um, Pick his brains. What a dinner party this would be, by the way. The beauty, by the way. So that's absolute beauty. Beauty. Yeah. Yeah. Superb. Yeah. Muhammad Ali, Nelson Mandela, Mike Tyson, Michael Jordan, which that's the first time he's made a list, and I cannot believe. Yeah. And Freddie Mercury. Fred, yeah. Great, great. I mean, your books, Box to Box, The Big If, The Unforgettable Blackness, Janet and John Does Dallas. <laughs> And the Freddie Mercury autobiography, no? And the Hobbit. I can't believe the Hobbit was there. Wow. <laughs> War and Peace. <coughs> hey, Kurt, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very, very much indeed. It has. I've loved and it. I've loved one it, boys. I'd like to proud. find out a bit more about is, uh, is, is the uh, Driftfield Destroyer, and I'll be, I'll be dipping into box to box. You can guarantee that. It's available in all good bookstores, isn't it? Yeah, I'll just um, I'll get my PayPal up now, Rob, and you can send me twelve quid over, pal, and I'll I'll, I'll, I'll get you on it. I'll even down. sign it for an extra three quid. <laughs> is, is, is Welsh currency all right? You know we like to do things different. <laughs> By the way, I was I was delighted you picked the Miracle of Medina. That's one of the uh, that's in my all time top five sporting moments. Definitely that. It was one of it's in my top five of boozy days outs as well. It was. Oh. I can't, I, he I hope called? Aidy Walton What's he called, that kid who gives 33 to 1? Aidy Walton. What a knobhead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no one's so accurate. I mind I had 33 to 1 on you naming the fifth book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually, um, when does this come out? Oh, about three, four weeks. Uh, I'm actually out with Aidy Walton on Sunday. When I said knobhead, I mean, it's a lovely <laughs> that, isn't it? <laughs> I'm out with him bank holiday Sunday, so I'll be able to. I'll well, I, I didn't mean not bad. I didn't mean I'm, in an lovely way. I meant not bad. You know what I mean? Man, I can, SAS, mate, soft as shit, Curtis. I can see him in the pub now. Anybody, anybody, thirty-three. <laughs> All of a sudden, sixty footers start going. In. Is you know, he on Twitter? By the way, he's not People, on Twitter. No. Oh, we could have, we could have put him in it when we when we release it. Oh I mean, yeah, he's not on. <laughs> It's funny, Curtis. People can make big mistakes with golfing and betting. Um, there was this incident with Hideki Matsuyama that I seem to remember oh. not so long ago. <laughs> Tell him, Gaz. Tell him, Gaz. I back my go-to golfer for all majors for the past six, seven years has been Hideki Matsuyama. And I, I said on this, the first one of these, we had Matt Letizia on, and I said, I'm, I'm finished with Matsuyama. I'm not ever, ever backing him again. He was 45 <laughs> to 1, and he wins the Masters. Uh, you didn't have a penny on? 54 pence in the end. I had, to, <laughs> I had 54 <laughs> pence in my account. I thought, oh, I can't let... I'd rather he lost. Oh, <laughs> that hurts. 
Oh, uh, it's more than anything, mate. <laughs> yeah. It's more than anything. Quality. Hey, well, thanks again, Curtis. We're going to let you crack on with your day, but it's been an absolute pleasure. I look forward to... Uh, and I will see on you on the 29th of June, Curtis. Looking forward to it, mate. Bring... Uh, Is your missus coming with you? Um. Yeah, to the yeah to the golf of the hotel. Yeah, and she can come yeah, yeah, and yeah. do whatever. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, we'll yeah. get you all in. I'll send you a list who else is playing as well, so you can uh, can have a look. Top man, top man. Cheers, mate. Cheers, guys. Cheers. 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 See you later. Mate. Bye. Shut up. Well, I've listened to Kimmy Fire, and to be honest with you, I'm still in the dark over here. Ooh ha. So there we are. Give me five with Curtis Woodhouse. Or was it give me three, Gaz? It was give me three in parts. Give me five in most. <laughs> he was brilliant, wasn't he? Yeah, love it. I love him. Honestly, I think he's a, he's a like I said before, uh, some, someone put the other day, it was, it's so many years since, since Alan Ball left us. And not only I miss Alan Ball as a person, but I miss his speech as well. The, the speech he made was, was, was outstanding. And like I said before, Curtis is is the closest we've got to that because it's a proper story about how he started and his dad and how it ended and oh I, well I can't tell it, it, it honestly it's a, it's a wonderful wonderful story yeah I look forward to hearing that myself one day and of course uh, just a quick reminder that Curtis's book is available so uh, that's is it? Did you have a book yeah did you know that you no I didn't know that yeah it's it's out there apparently. What's uh, it called? Box to box, I think it's box called. Box to box. You can see what he's done there, can you? Oh, I know what he's done there. <laughs> so that more or less brings another uh, installation of the Gimme Five podcast to uh, its rightful conclusion. Um, this, of course, as ever, has been a Gimme Five production, uh, courtesy of Tis Done Productions uh, and the wonderful Ian Parsons, who is there in his little technical laboratory making all things happen. You can't see him at home, sadly, but we can and we feel better because of it. Yes, Gaz? So I, I just wanted to point out as well that I thought this would be the least Welsh ever uh, episode, but he, how he got in. Johnny Owens? Johnny Owens, yeah, Johnny Owen, the uh, the the Merthyr Magic Owen. Man, yeah, the and Magic uh, Man. When you get when you get down for your grand tour of Wales, and we've done a couple of medieval festivals, and uh, you know the I'm going, I'm going the Tidville. We'll be we'll be hot footing it to Merthyr for you to tiptoe through the Tidville. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Thank you very much for your company. It's been an absolute pleasure. Until next time, this has been the Give Me Five podcast, and it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. Nanu nanu. Nanu nanu ho. Thank you.